Let's talk about an example now in the rules. A motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection device must be capable of carrying the motor starting current. It has to be able to start. How do you do that? You go to table 43052, and that table describes the different percentages depending upon the type of protection device. Let's focus on other motors, not wound rotor, not direct current. So if you have a one-time fuse, you set it at 300%. If you have a dual element fuse, you set it at 175. If you have an in -time, inverse time breaker, you set it at 250%. Now, I remember when I was studying beginning in motors, and I didn't understand, well, why would a one-time fuse be sized at 300%, and why is a dual element sized at 175, and why is a circuit breaker going to be at 250%? It's just simply because of the characteristics of the type of overcurrent devices. You're talking about this inrush current coming inside here. It's looking to be responsive to be able to protect it under short circuits and ground fault, but it has to be high enough to allow it to be able to allow that motor to start. Let's take a look at an example here. I have a two-horsepower motor. It has a full load amps of 11 amps. It has the code book full load current of 12 amperes. How do you size the conductors? You size the conductors at the full load current at 125%. We take the 12 amperes times the 1.25 equals 15 amperes. And I need a 15 ampere wire, table 31015B16 at 75 degrees C, and 14 gauge wire is rated for 20 amperes. So I'm okay to put it on because it has at least 15. How do you size the breaker short circuit protection? You go to motors, inverse time breakers, you will always size the breaker protection device not greater than 250%. So you take your motor. You take your full load current listed in the code book times 2.5. That comes out to be a 30 amp protection device. So therefore, I would go to 240.6A and a 30 amp breaker with 14 gauge wire. Now, Ryan, I know, Steve, I'm, I'm going to get with you. you. You teach calculations all the time. You do a lot of exam preparation and continuing education. What, what is the guy's that you're teaching, what do they feel about this thing, a 14 gauge wire and a 30 amp breaker? Well, if they're not real uh, uh, accustomed to motors, uh, they're uncomfortable with it. They're saying, well, that's way too big. You can't put that size of breaker on, you know, 14-gauge wire. Uh, and it makes them uncomfortable if, if it's their first uh, real exposure to it. Ryan, what about your experience with people <coughs> that have been exposed to it for a while? They've been, they're inspectors or contractors. How do you think most people feel about this, putting a bigger breaker or protection on, on smaller wires? I think a lot of people understand that it's allowed and few people are comfortable with it because few people understand why it's allowed. And, and when I teach, I, I find myself spending so much more time on the difference between ground faults and short circuits, circuits versus overloads. And boy, you can, it, it seems to me it's something that, that it's like a eureka kind of thing. Finally, it, it clicks with you and you say, wait a minute, I get it now. Now I get it. It's two different things. There, you know, you've got ground fault and short circuit. It, it's a high amount of current. Take two black conductors and bang them together. Is it going to trip a 20 amp breaker? Yeah, it's going to trip a 2,000 amp breaker. You know, I, I've 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 seen myself where you have a fault you, you, in a box, and I, I didn't do this intentionally, but you can take two 12 gauge wires in a four square box, and uh, you have some sort of a ground fault, and it should have tripped the 20 amp breaker. Well, it didn't. It tripped the 400 amp main outside. So if you're concerned that a, a 20 amp breaker, or excuse me, a 60 amp breaker, isn't going to trip and protect 12 gauge wires, well, for Pete's sake, it'll it'll trip a 400, it'll trip a 4,000 amp breaker. The key, what you're saying, is that without getting into details, circuit breakers and overcurrent protection, they have what is called time current curves. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the short circuit range. A 20 amp breaker protected by a 200 amp main, protected by a 400 amp main, protected by an 800 amp main. It's going down the line you don't know which breaker is going to trip. That's right. You would hope it would be nice if the 20 amp breaker tripped, or at least the 200 amp breaker, or <coughs> at least don't go, at least don't, but don't go up and take the whole building out. Here you're a service electrician doing some service work, working in a box, and wham, 
You bring the entire building down, and you're mm. thinking, oh, my gosh, what the heck happened? Well, when you get into short-circuit currents, that's the way it's going to work out. So anybody any experience would know that, listen, you put a 40-amp breaker, 60-amp breaker, and our example here was like I think it was a 30-amp breaker on 14-gauge wire. Right. We're perfectly fine there. That's yeah. not a problem at all. Absolutely. For short circuits right. and ground faults. Eric? Yeah, and, and I don't think we've gotten to it yet, but uh, there is on continuous duty motors, there's overload protection. And so therefore, and the overload well, no, protect Let's look at the slide right here. Ryan was talking about this protects against shorts. Right. The overloads protect against an overload, and the motor for some reason is drawing so much. And if you have the overload protection covered by the overload device, and you have the short circuits protected by the short circuit protection device, you have to provide overcurrent protection which is current in excess of its equipment rating. You have to provide overcurrent protection. You just can't do it in one physical element. And the fact that this is going to be 40 amps and this is going to be a device that's not an ampere rating because it's electronically setting, that people lose that. Yeah. So <clears throat> what the key here is if the motor is thermally protected and you don't have a starter, well, then the motor takes care of the overload. All you need is short circuit and ground fault protection. Is that what you're going to say there? Right, but also if, if you look at the calculations, the, uh, the conductor is based on 125% of the full load current, but the overload is, is typically based at 125% of the full load amps, and those, those are roughly the same. So, you know, your conductor is, is also protected through your overload. So this takes care of the overload. The 30 amp breaker would take care of the fault of a short circuit of ground right. fault. So there's no problem with taking 14 gauge wire protecting up uh, with 30 amp wire. I mean, with the third, a 30 amp device for short circuits. And I think we need to make sure that's uh, 30 amp. It looks like there's <coughs> 20 in that graphic there. We have to change that to 30. <coughs> Anything else, Ryan? Yeah, if I could just say one more thing. I think we're going to cover air conditioners after motors, and I would just invite whoever's watching the video. This can this can get to be a bit much for a person. I mean, you've got a you've got a controller, you've got a, a heater, a motor. There's so many different components here. And it, it can be a little bit intimidating, in fact, overwhelming, especially if this isn't your world. Uh, oh, yeah. we're, you know, if, if that's the case, then, uh, you know, just kind of listen and then watch, watch us do an air conditioner. It's a little bit more down to earth. You can see that at your own house. There's less stuff going on. It's the same principle. Though. I like that. Master like the that. air conditioner, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll help you do it. Master the air conditioner. Understand the concept. This plus this equals this. If you can figure that concept out, I can promise you, you're going to figure out motors, you'll figure out feeder taps, transformer secondaries, it's all over current protection, and it's just, you know, you just climb that ladder a little bit at a time, and, and boy, before you know it, you're, you're going to have this stuff figured out. Let's do another example. Eric? And also, just real quick, I have to point out that 175%, that for example, of a dual element fuse, or 250% of an inverse time circuit breaker do represent the maximums. And many manufacturers will build equipment that can operate well within those percentage limits. It's, it's actually pretty common to protect a motor with a circuit breaker rated at 125% of the motor because the manufacturer's device can do it and it's listed to, to be so. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about motors. <coughs> I lived in Coral Springs and I had a boat lift. And in order for, some, you know, I'm competitive world-class barefoot water skier, and I've been doing this for 30-something years. So I had a boat lift, and I would, you would, it would take the, the drum switch and turn it one way, and it would drop the lift down, and I'd go skiing, and I'd come back, and you'd take the drum switch, put it the other way, and it'd come up. Every once in a while, every few years, I would come back after I went skiing, and I saw that my lift was all the way up to the top. And I'm thinking, well, I know that we dropped it down, and we went skiing, I don't understand why my lift is back to the top, but whatever, who knows, I don't know. I get there and I smell like a, you know, burning brake or like a clutch kind of smell. And I'm thinking, get there, my motor is burnt out. I'm thinking, the heck's the problem here? So go out and get a new motor, half horsepower motor, put it back in there again, get it all set up. Two or three, four years later, my boat lift is up. Now I have a little experience about what's going on here and I'm thinking, I got a feeling I have a burnt-out motor. I'm going to be smelling brake, you know, brake or clutch here. I get up there, smell it. I know what it is. I got a burnt-out motor. Put the motor in, replace it again. A few years later, I see my boat lift up. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? But you know what? This was a half-horsepower motor. 
it drew 120 volts. I think it drew somewhere like around 6 amperes. Now, I'm skiing with a buddy of mine, Wilson Power, down in uh, Coconut Creek. He's a barefooter with mine. And so I said, listen, you know what? I need to provide overload protection for this motor because the motor did not have internal overload protection. And I'm thinking, okay, it's, it draws 6 amps. And I said, can you get me a fuse that's an 8-amp fuse? 125%, right, Eric? You talked about the overload protection. Mm -hmm. And so I got the nameplate, 125%. He says, Mike, he comes with a 30-amp disconnect, comes with a fuse. He says, I couldn't get an 8-amp fuse. All I got was a 6-amp fuse. I'm thinking, well, I don't know if this is going to work. So he puts a 6-amp fuse in this motor, disconnecting means. It takes all of about maybe 20 seconds or 20 minutes to put it inside there. After that, never had a problem again. Why? Because the motor... Maybe if it drew six amperes under a load, it was such a short duration that the overcurrent protection. And I did have the fuse blown. And I found out why my lip was going up. You know why it was? A bird would come by and fly and land on this drum switch that it had a, like a little peg out there. It would land on there. And I saw it. I'm like, you're the one that's cost me 1200 bucks. He would land on there, but when he land on there, what happened? It no, went it's down. Close. It turned the thing <laughs> on. He took, I guess he took off. As he took off, that pushed it down. And I thought, $1,200 cost me a motor. All I had to do was find out the nameplate rating in the motor, set the overload device at 100%. Because if it works at 100%, <clears throat> hey, I have perfect protection. If it doesn't hold at 120%, 100%, I could do what? Go up to 125% or overload protection. Wherever you possibly can, when you have motors, you want to set the overload device to the nameplate rating as close as possible. And with electronic, like you're saying, Steve, with the electronic devices, you can set the dip switches, get it down closer, 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 closer. Ah, that's not working there. Then just toggle it back up again. That takes care of the overload. But you know what happened, Ryan? No problem with my 20-amp breaker. Yeah. I blew it every single time. Right because I had no overload protection and went into the short circuit condition and on the short circuit condition, boom, it tripped my breaker. Yep. That's the combination that provides the protection. All right, let's go on to an example here. Let's see if we can put it together. Maybe it's a little, you'll feel all a little better here. All right, seven and a half horsepower motor, three phase, 230 volts, table 430.52, says the full load current is 22 amperes. You guys can put this on pause and do it yourself here. So 22 amperes on table 430. 250, and you size the conductor 125%. Okay, I have to do the math here. What's 22 times 1.25? I think that came out to be 22 times 1.25. 27.5. 27 27.5. Go to the 75 degree C column. What wire is 27.5? 10 gauge wire. Rated 35 amp. Okay, 10 gauge wire. Got it. How do you size the short circuit protection? Well, I'm going to go to a breaker. Is that a breaker looking? Yeah, that's a breaker. At a breaker, 250%. So I take the breaker, I take the full load current listed on the tables at 2.5, 250%, 55 amperes. It, there's no standard size in 43052C1 exception one says that when you do this calculation, it doesn't correspond to the standard size, then go up to the next standard size, 240.6A says, okay, put a 60 amp breaker, put 10 gauge wire, have overload device that's responsive to the motor nameplate current you won't have a problem. 